in our country, Katoa. Welcome everyone to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council. Uh, welcome to my colleagues, councillors, uh, staff, uh, the public and the media. Um, I, I want to open this meeting with uh, noting and acknowledging uh, the very sad and sudden passing of Graham Crombie last week. Um, the loss to, um, to the council and to our various uh, institutions here is uh, considerable. But it's nothing like the loss, the, the incalculable loss of such an early passing uh, to his family. And I extend condolences and sympathies to his family in this situation. Um, I just want to acknowledge the contribution specifically that Graham made to council companies. And I'd remind you that he was, um, he started in 2015 as a director of the Dunedin uh, Stadiums Limited. Well, actually before that, he was, the, he was appointed a DCC rep on the uh, Museum Trust Board in 2010 and became a chair, the chair in 2011 and has done an absolutely stunning job uh, on, on, the council, on the Museum Trust Board. Uh, but then he went on to uh, become a director of DCHL in 2012, became the chair in 2013, uh, and the director of stadium properties in 2015. So he has made a considerable contribution uh, within the, the council family of, of uh, companies or institutions. But I, I'd like to just also talk a little about, um, or note, the contribution he's made in the wider community because until um, I was reminded of it uh, after his passing, I hadn't realised what an extensive contribution Graham uh, had made. Um, he was, as you know, um, appointed Deputy Commissioner of the Southern District Health Board in 2015, um, but among other things, he was one of the inaugural independent directors of Surf Life Saving New Zealand in 2013. He's the chair of Action Engineering here in, um, in Dunedin. He is, is the uh, currently, or was at his passing, the independent chair of Innovative Health Technologies, uh, independent director of NZCA, that's the um, independent chartered accountants, um, chair of New Zealand Genomics, that's the collaboration between Otago, Auckland and Massey Universities in genomic research since 2013. Uh, trustee of the Are Te Uru Kōkiri Centre, uh, an independent trustee of the Orokanui Foundation uh, in 2013 and became president of St Kilda Brass in 2013. And even before that, uh, he was a past chairman of Otago Polytechnic and credited, that was between 2002 and 2010, and credited with um, making an enormous difference in turning that, uh, that organisation around in a marked manner. Uh, he was past chairman of Southern Health Link, uh, Southern Link Health for 10 years, um, past chairman of Altusk New Zealand, business and leadership coaching, um, past director of Vitae International um, and New Zealand, uh, he was within the New Zealand Institute of Chartered Accountants, varying roles including um, a Targa committee member and chair and as the president of the New Zealand Institute. So um, Graham Crombie made uh, a considerable contribution within this organisation, within this community and within this nation. And we will very much miss uh, his, um, his input and his contribution. And so I just note again um, what a loss it is, particularly to his family, and extend again um, my condolences to them. And I think it would be appropriate if we stood and had uh, a, moment si a few moments silence. <coughs> Uh, now, our prayer um, is going to be led by uh, the Reverend Greg Hewson, uh, University Chaplain. Oh. 
Potato, I'd add my sympathies to you all on the loss of Graham Crombie. He worked closely with my colleague Mike Wright at the Polytech over those years, and um, Mike sadly passed away at a similar age. So um, tomorrow you'll gather to remember uh, Graham and to honour him and to support each other in the grief of our whole community, so it's very appropriate to honour him today. Um, I'm here as University Chaplain, but also representing the Dunedin Interfaith Council. I organise the roster for these, cut, these prayers each time, and we're very grateful at our recent Interfaith Harmony Dinner for Councillor Christine Gary, who came to represent the Council and spoke about the importance of interfaith relationships in our increasingly diverse community, so thank you very much for that. It's a 150-year celebration for the University all year, very busy time. But please, um, you're all welcome to come to the church service on the 2nd of June, 10am at Knox Church. You'll all be getting um, invitations. So a Māori blessing. May calm be spread around you. May the sea glisten like greenstone and the shimmer of summer dance across your path. Kia ora te marino. Kia whakapapa paunamu te moana. Kia tere te karau, karohi rohi i mua i huarahi. We give thanks for the opportunity to meet on behalf of the wider community. We give thanks for the agenda, for the importance of the South Dunedin Community Hub, climate change, George Street traffic through which I've just push biked, for all the work of the um, community boards feeding into the work of council, for all of the um, discussions that um, will happen here today, we ask God's blessing as the council explores all of these policies to fit within an overall strategic framework of well-being for our whole community. And so we give thanks for social well-being for the economic development strategy, the environment strategy, the arts and culture strategy, the three waters strategy, the spatial plan, the integrated transport strategy, parks and recreation strategy. And we pray that wisdom and discernment um, will operate here this afternoon and always. May calm be spread around you. May the sea glisten like greenstone and the shimmer of summer dance across your path. Amen. Thank you. Got a great Got it. <coughs> right, councillors, we'll move on to apologies. There are none. Uh, confirmation of the agenda. I'll move that council confirms the agenda with the following alterations. Um, in regard to Standing Order 2.1, Option C be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking amendments, and Item C4, Appointment to the Otago Museum Trust Board, be deferred until the Council meeting to be held on 26th of February 2019. Obviously, the passing of Mr Crombie's complicated appointments to the um, Museum Board, and we need to reappraise that. So I'll move that. Second to Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Item 5, declarations of interest. I'll move that the Council... <coughs> uh, well, first of all, are there any additions? Councillor Elder. Uh, I think it's a bit too late, really, but I'm just here at the moment. Okay, we'll add that in. So <coughs> I'll move that we amend the elected member's interest register to take account of Councillor Elder's additional responsibilities as attachment A, and confirm the proposed management plan for elected members' interest, and that we note the executive leadership team's interest register attached as attachment A. Second to Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. <coughs> Confirmation of minutes. Um, I'll move the Council confirms the public part of the minutes of the ordinary Council meeting held on the 29th of January, 2019 is a correct record. Second to Councillor Staines. Any discussion? Uh, I'll, I'll move it. I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Um, and I'll move that the Council confirms the public part of the minutes of the Ordinary Council <coughs> annual plan meeting held on the 29th of January 
as a correct record, and I understand there was a correction from you, Councillor Vandivis, on a, on a record of a voting, so that's been uh, uh, amended. Second to Councillor Staines, any discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. <clears throat> On to the community boards, Councillor Wiley. Your Worship, uh, I'd like to move the minutes of the, uh, the community boards uh, numbered seven through 12. Second, Councillor Elder. Is there any discussion on any of those? Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just on behalf of the uh, West Harbour Community Board, I'd um, just like to pass on uh, the thanks of that board to staff, a uh, fairly momentous uh, milestone in the completion of the State Highway 88 Shared Path Project and the Memorandum of Understanding being signed between Council uh, and NZTA and uh, the tender for the completion of that work. Um, going out uh, this month, um, which is uh, truly remarkable, um, and we look forward to seeing how that evolves um, and, and towards the completion of that fairly significant infrastructure project. Thank you. The discussion, I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. On to item 13, um, Ms. Hayanu and Ms. Graham. <clears throat> um, oh, and, and Tammy. Welcome. Do you want to introduce this or? Happy to take um, questions from councillors. Councillors, questions. This is the, regarding the um, approach for engaging with the community on the annual plan. So, questions? Councillor Gary. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you had any plans uh, beyond Youth Council for engaging youth um, with the annual plan community engagement. Through the Chair, yes, we, we've got plans to engage the youth through a variety of ways. So we will be developing engagement packs to go to our stakeholders um, and community organisations so that they can uh, use those t um, within their networks. We are also uh, liaising with the Otago University Students Association and the Polytech Association um, in terms of uh, a North Dunedin activity or event that works for uh, youth or young adults in that area. <coughs> Can I add to that, that um, I interacted with the new OUSA president uh, last night, and James, is his name, and he is very passionate about involving students in local uh, affairs. So I think that the efforts of our team will um, align very well with his efforts and OUSA's efforts to encourage engagement with the student body. Councillor Vanderbilt. <coughs> An attachment A, uh, Central City Upgrade. There's a couple of paragraphs there, but no mention of pedestrianisation. Is that not something which, given that this is an update and it's now been talked about here at least, is that not something which we should be advising the citizens of Dunedin that is being considered for George Street and the Octagon? Oh, I think, well, it, it's for council to determine, but as is worded here, um, it says that we are in the process of consulting with our community about what they might want to see in the central city, so that's the stage in the process that we're at. Okay. Um, uh, further up, three waters. We're improving our water quality testing and inspecting more of our stormwater pipes. Wouldn't it actually be uh, more accurate to say that we're spending much less than depreciation on stormwater renewals rather than just saying we're inspecting more of our pipes? Wouldn't that be more a more accurate description of what we're actually doing? I, th I think the wording in there is accurately reflecting what we're doing in the draft budget. Given that it's a budget, and given that we've had a fairly recent expose of the significant underspend in this area. Uh, Councillor, your question's been answered. Go on to the next one. Thank you. 
Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. It's just a question around um, how the discussion is being framed in the document. And there's only one specific question that we're asking, and that's around the provision or the proposed provision for a free central city bus loop. And I've got no question, no concerns with us asking that question, but it seems odd that there's only one question um, being asked given the, the other, pro other proposals that were raised during the January meeting. Is that because that was the only resolution that <coughs> specifically asked for it? Yes, that, that's correct. We are asking a general question. Look, what do you think of the, the plan? It's there, I think, on page 37. What do you think of our plans for next year? But that, the resolution around the, the question around the bus loop was the only specific thing that council at the time asked us to include in the consultation. Historically, would it be fair to say that we get more feedback on issues that we specifically ask questions for feedback on? Oh, that would be hard to say. I think sometimes there are issues in the community that we haven't asked questions on that have ended up being the main um, source of discussion in annual plan. And would staff have any issue? I mean, is it beyond our, our capacity to add, add things at this point, or would this be the forum that we would need to make those suggestions? This is the purpose of bringing the draft document to council for them to consider whether it adequately reflects what they um, had decided we were going to consult with our community on. So now is the time to, to um, suggest any changes or additions. Councillor Lord. <coughs> My question was more or less the same as Aaron's. It was regarding the, the forming and posing of questions that's been answered. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you. I'm just raising, um, uh, it was a community board presentation uh, at, at the annual plan meetings where there was a specific item around the Waikawaii landfill and that item to be included in consideration of the annual plan. And I've, talk to Sandy a bit about coming come for this meeting. It's not on the list right now. Um, and so the question really is how to get it on the list given that it was at that meeting. And um, so I'll send you an email, I guess, to remind you exactly what was requested. Um, and, and then that can be considered by council as part of the deliberations during Yeah, because at that meeting, um, I asked the specific question is, could this be considered as an ad hoc resolution given that it was coming from the community board? Thanks. Councillor Elder. Um, plan, uh, the proposed um, resolutions and being put forward. One of the things um, I, we put a re resolution forward about um, the tracks audit and giving some budget to the results of that track audit towards tracks. And I was wondering whether that should be in there as part of the consultation? So on page, on the top of page 37, you'll see um, bottom of page 36, top of page 37, we've outlined the other things that council discussed at their meeting and have highlighted the reports that staff will be preparing for council to consider during deliberations and the tracks are there. Ah, oh, cool, thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, and just for clarification, um, and I have to say that I love the language in here. I think it's really um, very accessible for any resident of the city. But this is a, um, looking at things we've varied from the long-term plan. Is that correct? And so if I take um, your question or your box, which talks about library or swimming pool on page 35, <coughs> that doesn't actually get a question because that is all going to be within the budget of the long-term plan. I presume? Yes. And equally, comments um, such as, or questions such as Council of Anvises means that we've actually put more money in to do more than was in the long-term plan um, for the three waters in those particular areas. That's like 3.5 million in stormwater and things. So it's a variation on that long-term plan. Thank you. Councillor Gary. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just had a, a comment to make and then a question. Really like, as uh, Councillor Wilson said, the tone of the document, and it sounds very much like the style and tone follows along from the, the long-term plan. Um, is it um, the plan to have graphics that are consistent with what was in the long-term plan? Yes, the, the same style of graphics will be used in this. Fabulous. And secondly, I was just wanting to know, uh, because I believe the community will ask this question, in the work underway, a couple of big things that are underway, Peninsula Connection, is there perhaps um, an opportunity to put another sentence in there that just gives a little bit of an indication around the way forward or what happens next? Because that project is, is you know, not yet to be finished and uh, and the next part is yet to be decided as to where that will be but that will be the question in the community's mind and I just wonder if some it could be a general question or not question a general statement but just a little bit more information may be helpful it's just a suggestion we will take that on board and see if we can change it the, the nuance the challenge is this is reflecting what's in the annual plan as opposed to what's in the out year in the long-term plan. Councillor Wilson. Sorry, apropos of the notice of motion um, that is after this item, should we be asking, um, adding, if, if subject to that being passed, um, a line item under the, where the tracks are on page 36-37 about potential late way bridge? We had suspected that um, should that notice of motion be successful that we would add a bullet point on that being an upcoming report. But Thank we you. didn't want to predetermine the outcome. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Laufisa. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you for the mahi on this. It's, I know it's always ongoing and, a, and a, sometimes a headache. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the Māori impact statement and I'm just clarifying that the mechanism for Māori to contribute to local decision making, is that a hui? Uh, what's the form of that mechanism, please? Just clarifying um, with Maria, there isn't a hui planned for this, for this engagement with the Māori Participation Working Party, we have agreed for hui in each of the long-term plan years, okay. but not in the annual plan years, although the, we do engage with the Māori Participation Working Party at every meeting on the annual plan and its progress, but that's the only formal right. um, engagement that we have. Okay, so my question, my follow-up, I guess, is connected with um, Councillor Gary's question about engagement with young people. So given that we need to up our game in terms of participatory democracy, um, I know, and, and I know it's a headache and a, and a budgetary, there's budgetary constraints, but I would advocate for targeted hui with young people because there are lots of domestic young people that don't go anywhere near the Otago University or Polytech. Um, and also there's Pasifika and new migrants and refugees to engage with as well. Oh, and I thought about women this morning too. I think, uh, I don't know if I can answer it as directly as you wish, but really I see that the steps that we took in the 10 year plan year to utilize existing community networks to reach people through their own, their own um, meetings that they're having already is probably the more successful way than, than individual hui's about specific things, especially in this case where we don't have huge amounts to ask people about. And, so, and I know that I've been talking with um, Joy Gunn quite a bit. We've been talking about the need for really developing ongoing relationships with our community across a whole raft of issues. And I think that's why I, I guess we haven't gone down that path in terms of, for this. And I recognize utterly the need to connect with young people who are not tertiary students. And we have that very clearly in our minds. And I think that's where those community networks will come in very, very handy. the questions there are none right would someone like to move the resolutions councillor benson pope seconded councillor is that your hand councillor vandivis i was going to ask that they be taken separately oh sure councillor wilson second <clears throat> um councillor benson pope do you wish to speak to it 
Just briefly, um, Your Worship, thank you. I, I think um, <coughs> this has been traversed slightly already, but staff should be complimented on the nature of the documents they're producing, not only previously, but this follows the same pattern of printed material and other material that's much more accessible to the public um, in plain English. Uh, and pretty much uh, grammatically perfect. Well done, thank you. <laughs> yes, teacher. Councillor Hawkins. Oh, thank you, Worship. I'm not wishing to speak to the substantive motion, although I do support it, but I am proposing an amendment to the consultation document that include a specific question uh, that asks for people's support or otherwise for the principle of using um, council rates and or parking revenue to lower the cost of bus fares. It's alluded to in the higher level discussion of things that we are considering, um, but I think uh, it's worthy in conjunction with the conversation around the central city bus loop of um, being highlighted. Should, it be, should that be palatable to the mover and seconder, I'm happy for it to be absorbed. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'm happy to move it as an amendment. Do you have some wording, Councillor Hawkins? Oh, yeah, sorry, I've said... <coughs> Here it is. Um, in the first instance, do you move it, second it, happy? So that becomes the third, um, the, the third um, part of that resolution. Um, Councillor O'Malley, you wish to speak? No, oh, well, it doesn't need it, given that the mover and second are agreed to it. So, right, further speakers. Councillor Wilson. Um, I'm I'm very happy to, with that amendment going in there, under the, but I'm just concerned about the legality and there's um, whether we can because of the PTOM rules and I don't, I'm not familiar enough with them. So I, I presume that would be subject to someone just checking that or are you happy? The question is for the staff really, are they happy that that can be done legally? We would need to check, check it. The one thing we would note is that it's not plain English, that resolution, so we would say if you... Thank you. Um, <coughs> you're, okay. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to support it, really, because it does bring the whole thing up to the centre of debate, and it's, it's a, we've been needing to bring this up for a long time, and whether we legally can or can't at this point, it's probably not as important as actually bringing the whole debate forward and, and, and getting around this whole question of who really is involved in controlling public transport in the city, and how can we can respond to it. Thanks. Councillor Vanderbilt. I'm happy to support this as well. I think it needs to be out there in the uh, public arena. Uh, people need to know what is being uh, considered and wondering if it could basically be made as a recommendation C rather than absorbed into one or the other. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is C. C. It's okay. separate. Thank you. And I'm happy to take it separately, separately. again. If that's Thank what the, the will of the meeting. Okay, are there any further speakers? Councillor Benson Pope, you'll write a reply. Just in terms <coughs> of, the, of the addition, um, I think that's entirely consistent with the discussion that we, the, the position we already agreed that we would consider um, parking revenue in the discussions with ECA, the OIC, and NZTA as a possible source for the backup funding that we agreed in respect <coughs> of the bus loop anyway. Mm. And I note that the resolution specifically mentions the principle of. So it's not a decision about anything, it's just asking people about their principle. So I'll, I'll put A. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Um, I'll put B. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Record Councillor Vanavis against. That's carried. And C, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Right. <coughs> You're staying put, are you? No, no, I think sorry. <coughs> <coughs>
Go on to item 14, Target Museum Funding Request Outcomes Discussion. Welcome, Mr Dixon, Mr Pickford. I'm happy to take questions. Questions, councillors. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you. It's just a, a timing question, really, in seeking assurances from staff that uh, from a process point of view, following whatever outcomes come out of the May meeting that are informed by this paper that's forthcoming in time for the May meeting, that the formulation and approval of any letter of objection, should that be Council's desired outcome, be able to be turned around by the 31st of May? Uh, yes, we, we're confident that uh, we can work within that timetable and we will ensure that um, colleagues at the Target Museum are fully aware of the timetable within which we're operating. Any further questions? There are none. Would someone like to put the resolution? Councillor Lord, second Councillor Elder. Councillor Lord, do you wish to speak to it? Any further speakers? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> um, item 15, the Mosgiel Aquatic Facility Project Update. <coughs> Welcome, Mr West and Ms. Ms Graham. How nice to see you again. <clears throat> right. Do you wish to introduce this? or? Uh, questions, councillors? No questions? Someone like to move? Councillor Staines, move. Councillor Hall, second. Councillor Staines, do you wish to speak to it in the first instance? Councillor Vanderbus. This is a <coughs> wonderful um, outcome in terms of Mosgiel and in terms of Dunedin ratepayers generally, I believe. The noting, finally, of the fundraising target of $3.2 million having been met uh, is going to make sure that Mosgill gets the best pool that it was ever going to get and that they <coughs> have some ownership of the pool as well because of the significant number of funds that they've raised. I particularly want to pay uh, uh, my respects and to honour Irene Mosley for her perseverance in making <coughs> this happen. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of other people were certainly important in making it happen as well, uh, and the DCC committee, um, uh, headed by Ms. Uh, Councillor O'Malley, um, I think it's Irene um, Mosley. Correction, it was headed by Councillor Staines. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Um, I think it really is down to Irene Mosley to take personal credit for having persevered with this and got, I think, a most satisfactory result all round. Thank you. To the speakers. Councillor Gary. Have been uh, on that uh, panel before to facilitate this outcome. So um, I'd like to add my congratulations. Councillor O'Malley. I'm going to be relatively quick and, and acknowledge that the community board will actually be taking over much of the role that the councillors took in terms of community representation as this goes forward. So there still is an opportunity for the community to be directly involved in this. And um, I acknowledge the great effort also done by staff on this. Thanks. Councillor Elder. 
Oh, no, I was just doing thumbs up to Robert Weiss. Oh, right. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. You need to be careful. You might end up buying something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Councillor Staines, do you wish to exercise your right of reply? Thank you, Worship. I think it just <coughs> is important to note uh, that, that there has been a lot of effort go into getting the project to this point. Um, I know that there had been a lot of friction between the um, call, um, committee and council and the process that was followed with the establishment of the advisory group really brought the whole thing together. Staff did a wonderful job, I think, in drawing all of those threads into what we now have uh, and, and the thing is going forward. So, you know, my mother who turned 94 last week, may still yet get a chance to put a toe in the pool <laughs> <laughs> when it's built. <clears throat> right, um, I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? That's carried. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Speed limits by law. Mr Saunders. Welcome. Now, would you like to introduce it or you just go straight to questions? Straight to questions, questions councillors. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Worship. It's an urban design question. Um, <coughs> the demarcation of the school clusters um, is something that has been conducted through signage um, and road treatments and, and others. Is the proposed extension of those zones going to be met with attendant extension of um, those <coughs> treatments? Like how, what will it physically look like, this proposal? So the, um, well, I, I guess the taking the two separately for an individual school, there will need to be there'll be variable speed signs up. So there there will need to be some sort of demarcation of where the zone starts. The Central City School cluster, where there was a specific uh, submission on, given the nature of a number of the heritage buildings up there, how we use the signs and the demarcation of those zones. Uh, and there's been some conversations between our staff and urban design and heritage just to ensure we get that balance right. The need to make sure drivers are aware as they enter a zone that they are entering it, um, but also not a proliferation of highlighted yellow signs and, and other things. So we are aware of it, and it was a um, it was a submission that we um, we listened carefully to, and, and we'll give some consideration to as we're finalising that that package of signs. But ultimately, the answer to your question is yes. We need signs to delineate those areas. I guess one of the benefits of the variable message signs is they're only um, on and flashing for the period of time where we need the reduced speed in place, um, which is better than having a, a permanent sign in place. And, and just secondly, sorry, um, I'm interested in the provision for outside of the set hours at the start or the end of the day, 10 minutes at any other time when children cross the road or enter or leave vehicles at the roadside, which taken literally could mean all day, every day. Do you have any? Uh, so, sorry, that, that was um, that was <coughs> included in there to allow for those days where they might have a lunchtime finish. So it would be a, a mass entrance or exit. So if the school hours <coughs> shifted on a day, um, so we didn't get caught out by having having the set times only at the start and finish. But then we have a half day or something. It just gives the ability because the signs will be part of the network and we'll have manual control over them. We we can activate the signs at lunchtime if if a school was finishing at lunch on a particular day. Councillor Lord. Yeah. Um, look, Richard, my. I'm very happy with these recommendations, and when the time comes, I'm willing to move them. But my question is more in relation to the. Were you here when Mike Lee spoke to the public forum? So what I was wanting to know, and and my observation would be that we have more cars on the road now. But do you have firm data? I certainly know when I come into town, like Cocker Valley School, it just seems more kids driving to school. I see it around the Tyree, more kids driving, more 
off street parking required because of those sorts of things. And would it be fair to say, or do we have any data that would reinforce that, or is that just my personal belief? And I'm thinking the last five to ten years, <coughs> do we have more cars generally between parents taking kids to school and all those things just in general? Um, look, I, I don't have, we, yes, we have the data. Um, I don't have an intimate knowledge to answer that question now, other than specific areas of the city that, that I have looked into on, on request where we know there's been an increase. Um, the, a number, the, the feedback we get from a lot of people is there is an increase. Um, perhaps one thing we could do is in our next quarterly report to the Infrastructure Committee, we could include a section on sort of historic traffic counts at some key areas of the city, because we do have that data. So we'll, I'll have a chat to the team about it, including that in our next quarterly report. Further questions? Okay, <clears throat> there are no more. Would someone like to move the uh, resolution? Oh, Councillor Lord, you said you were willing to. And Councillor Hall, second. Um, do you wish to speak to it? Are you happy with it? Any further speakers? There are none. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Now, item 17, Community Board representation. Ms Bodecker and Ms, Ms Graham will be here to answer any questions. <clears throat> I note that there's um, a resolution being put up by Councillor Gary, which perhaps you could put on the wall. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Do you wish to introduce this? No, we're happy to take any questions if we can help. Right, I just note that the context here is that some weeks ago uh, a note was put out to councillors asking for feedback on this, um, on these sort of proposals by the Remuneration Authority. Um, I think staff got one uh, response, um, so, and that from, I think was from uh, Councillor Gary. So, it is, is appropriate that um, the resolution that's been put up um, is now on the board. Um, <coughs> difficult. So, look, I'm going to read this. Um, we'll just grow B because the rest you've got all the others in front of you. So let us just grow B so that you can read it. Okay, that's the new one. Oh, Does right. So um, that the council... So A is um, what's already... A noting one was the only one. Sorry? Right, so, um, so if, if a, a is the, the what's existing, a, one. existing one. So B is the council agrees that any pool from which community boards are paid is independent of the governance pool that remunerates councillors. And the second part of that is the Remuneration Authority continues to determine the remuneration of community board members and chairs rather than making them a, a, that a decision of council, thus maining, maintaining independence. Uh, C agrees that the amount of the governance pool that remunerates councillors should not be impacted by the existence or otherwise of community boards. D agrees that community board remuneration should reflect the number of residents represented by the whole board along with other relevant factors as determined by the Remuneration Authority and notes that the council feedback will be forwarded to the Remuneration Authority for its consideration. Yes, so, Ms Grant. Just for councillors' information, um, these resolutions answer each of the questions that the <coughs> Remuneration Authority asked of council and the community boards. So that's why it's been framed up in this way. So it provides a response from council on the um, three clear questions that they asked. So we'll just park that. Um, but so we'll ask any questions either of staff for clarification, or then we'll move on to questions of the mover. So, Councillor Gary. I just wonder if the staff could give us a little bit of context in terms of the history of how this has been paid in the past and what happens now. Um, well, as councillors will see from their papers, the authority are proposing the return to a pool arrangement, um, which is how things used to be a number of years ago. Um, pro currently, however, um, the authority sets the um, remuneration for elected members, both 
board members and councillors, and then there is an ability to um, adjust for positions of responsibility, which this council does for chairs. Uh. Can I add to that um, by way of explanation? Some years ago, when there was a, a pool, a complete pool for remuneration for councils around the country, it included, the pool included community boards. So the council was sized, or its community was sized, or whatever, and that was the pool, and councillor remuneration and community board remuneration came out of the same pool. It didn't distinguish between numbers of councillors, and it didn't distinguish between councils that didn't have community boards and those that did. So the net effect was that it, con it caused considerable anomaly. Roughly, uh, just to give you an illustration, at the time when Tauranga and Dunedin were the same size, the remuneration for Tauranga councillors was about 80,000 a year. The, the remuneration for Dunedin councillors was 42,000 a year at the same time. And that was because there were fewer councillors in Tauranga and there were no community boards in Tauranga. And we had more and, and community boards. So, Th th that's why this is relevant to that, th because the proposal to move back to a pool that included um, everyone would um, either be a, a revisiting those anomalies or reinstating those anomalies or requiring some mechanisms to obviate them. <coughs> so, further questions? Councillor um, Wilson. Uh is it debate or question still? Uh, so I'm just wondering about um, D, and noting that most of the community boards, I think, have said that the um, remuneration should not reflect the number of residents only. It's the phrasing which is positive, and I, I got, I read that and th um, first wondered whether that was saying it should be by number of residents, um, when the other criteria are not highly um, or aren't sort of specified, and I'm just wondering whether that should be in the negative um, to reflect the other criteria that are used, or whether that is the intention, I'm not quite sure. Right, well just clarify the intention, that's all you need. So the intention was, it was very clear from community board feedback um, that the other factors are important and I would concur with that. For example, Otago Peninsula has a tourism via which adds to the, the workload, and there are other examples of that throughout community boards. Um, the remuneration authority is well aware of those. That's been inputted at a national level um, and through the zones to um, to local government and the remuneration authority personally. Um, they've come to visit a number of times. Uh, and so I felt that it was important to have it in a general, you know, not to specify the criteria because they are quite wide. I didn't want to pin it down just to a couple. So the phrase I've used is other relevant factors. Okay. Um, Councillor O'Malley. I guess it's actually, it's going, uh, how do we deal with the wording of that? Because um, I, I feel too that the other community boards pretty much explicitly said population should not be part of the remuneration, except for Mosgiel Tari, which says should be the minimum. Um, is this the point to do it now, or I mean, it's well, kind of a... I, I, well, what I'd point out is that the community board... Just a question. Community boards can submit to the remuneration authority themselves? But the community board feedback, um, the five pieces that we'll be re have received will be submitted on behalf of each of those community boards, and this council now has an opportunity to submit, to submit on behalf of council. So that's the distinction I'd, I'd make, is that we will be passing on the, the views of the community boards faithfully, this is the view. This is intended to be the view of council that we vote on one way or the other. Not the view. Not this is not intended to reflect the views of the community boards, as I understand it. So, for the purposes of voting, because I'm on the Waikato community board, am I a councillor at large on this vote, or am I a representative of the community board on this vote? You're a councillor who understands some arguments that he's been given by people who have to meet with later. <laughs> okay. Councillor Gary. Um. It's 
might be helpful clarification. Um, that question was that, that that part of the motion regarding represented by the whole board is in relation to the question asked about should it be in relation to the whole board or uh, the representation of uh, by specific board members of a part of the community board area. Now that does happen on some community boards. It's something not something we're familiar with here in our area. So that's really what that was in an answer to specifically. So it might be that we may want to add an extra phrase in there rather than that's a possibility if that would satisfy um, satisfy Councillor O'Malley. And I suggest that while we could do the rest of the questions, you might just think about what that wording might be. Um, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, my questions around B Romans I, um, where it says any pool from which community boards are paid is independent of the governance pool that is um, assigned to this body for uh, apportionment. <coughs> If it wasn't from the governance pool, I mean, is there a proposal from the remuneration authority that there be the, the territorial authority being given be given a community board's pool to assign funding for? So, yeah, so I think the, there's there's three options, or at least three options. One is that there's one big pool, and community board of remuneration and councillor remuneration come out of that. The uh, the, the next option is that there are two pools, one for community, the community boards of a, an area and one for the councillors of the area, and th there's probably three or f number three and number four, which would be variations on that, depending on who did the divvying up. Or, I mean, for instance, it, it might not be a pool for community boards, it might be just this is what they get and the remuneration authority sets it rather than set a pool, but those are the two main. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to get, that was where I was going with these questions. So one and Romans 1 and Romans 2 seem to be d different ways of framing the same point. So if, they're being, if the remuneration is being set directly by the authority, then Romans 1 is sort of redundant and that doesn't really, where that comes from is kind of irrelevant. Because uh, who's doing the dividing up? If it's not, if we don't want it to be us. That's right. It would be them directly setting it. Questions. Well, I think my understanding is what this is saying is, if you're going to set a pool, we don't want to be we don't want to be making the decision on it as councillors. I think that's what. Right. Okay. Further questions. All right. Um, is there a seconder for for this, uh, Councillor Staines? Um, can I ask you to speak to this, Councillor Gary? Certainly, Your Worship. Um, some time ago when the remuneration for community board members was determined by this council, I can remember occasions when decisions were made and I'm sure they were made with the best of intentions, but certainly there was resentment amongst community board members um, around those decisions at times. It's a very difficult um, situation to put council in to decide on what the community boards are paid. And I do believe it affects the relationship. Um, if we look at a more national scale, the difference between community boards is immense. If you take the community boards in Christchurch, for example, you're paid a lot more money, and they have uh, a great deal more delegated responsibilities. Now, I'm not trying to say or advocate for more delegated responsibilities because I believe community boards can be very effective without those. But there is immense difference. In some community boards, particular individual community board members represent specific areas and that's what D was about. Um, and so it was very difficult at that time. When we moved to an independent decision making by the remuneration authority on what community board members would be paid, uh, that certainly made a difference to the relationship. Uh, and I believe the relationship between community boards and this council is a very good one. And it was commented on after the presentations to the annual plan, the draft annual plan budget, around uh, the quality of the community board presentations, the quality of the advocacy, uh, and just that the bar had been raised. 
So community boards are certainly valued by this council. In terms of criteria, uh, no, it should not be based solely on population. If you take a, a community board like Stewart Island, for example, it's a very small population, but goodness, look at the number of visitors they have and the issues they have to deal with around that special place. So there are a number of other factors. And the Remuneration Authority is well aware of this. That has been inputted, uh, fed back to them on numerous occasions since the start of this process several years ago. Um, one of the, the comments made in this report is around uh, recruit and retain uh, competent persons. And it's always been a view of mine that we need to support community boards with training, professional training. That was mentioned in their presentations and I know the Mayor uh, is very supportive of that. Uh, in terms of raising the bar, that's really important. But if we're going to recruit and retain competent people, we have to pay them fairly. If we don't, we're not going to get a variety of people standing for community boards. And with all due respect to my colleagues around the table, we do not want a situation where we have uh, white males over 70 uh, being the only ones who stand for community boards. For far too long, and don't worry, I've got the white hair too, um, for far too long, uh, that was the face of community boards. And I'm pleased to say that it is very different now. And if you look at the national body, Community Boards Executive Committee, which used to be a little bit like that, I'm very pleased to say uh, that that spread uh, of ages, ethnicities, uh, and gender has um, improved considerably. And it's much more varied. So if you pay fairly, uh, then you're going to get a variety of people standing and the community is going to be better uh, represented. In terms of valuing, I just want to make a, a, a passing comment that cheap shots on either side, as reported recently in the ODT, are not helpful, no matter uh, what their meaning is. Um, and I would just like to focus, as I finish, on the worth of community boards to this council. We've just been talking about the Mosgiel Aquatic Facility. Look at the um, input of local people and community board to that process. The Peninsula Connection with this council is very proud of, and rightly so. Uh, let me tell you, in the early part of this journey uh, on the Peninsula Connection, um, and there's really probably no one around this table uh, that was here then, but in the very early days of that journey, this council was opposed to or put obstacles in the way of that project. Now we're way beyond that now and we have unanimous support around this table for that project. But that was led by that community and that community board over many, many years. The recent Peninsula bus issue, the community board uh, had a hand in that along with a group of parents and community members. And on Freedom Camping Solutions, community boards have been hugely helpful in finding solutions. Obviously, along with staff and councillors, it's been a collaborative effort. So I believe that community boards are of huge value to this city, to this council, for reflecting the community back to council. It's a conduit, both back and forward, and we have a better democracy for it. Uh, and so uh, that is why I have put up this motion. Uh, with regards to the wording, I'm more than happy to change that and I wonder if we could perhaps um, add the words because the D was really about the whole board rather than the number of residents represented by each member. That was what it was an answer to. Uh, and if anyone wants to put up an amendment that... Uh, enumerates, the, articulates those criteria, I'm more than happy to hear that, but I think that if we keep it general, it, it would be better, because as I said, the, the Remuneration Authority is well aware of those individual criteria. Thank you. Right, so just to clarify, Lynn, um, you're adding the words, uh, assuming the seconder agrees, adding the words after uh, number of residents in D, number of residents represented by the whole board rather than by each individual member. Is that right? Yeah, and both of you are happy with that? Thank you. Okay, Councillor O'Malley.
still having a bit of issues with that simply because I know that, that I was party to that discussion in Waikowaiti and, and the actual use of the word population and remuneration was something they were quite specific about not wanting to be included in the remuneration consideration. So um, I'm thinking that community board remuneration should reflect many relevant factors in addition to population. Just as simple as that. So the population goes towards the back of the statement. Um, and um, that way, and that many relevant factors okay. goes to the front. Now, look, can I ask that, the mover and seconder how they feel about that? Because I can so, I get your point. Uh, I would be more than happy to have the, uh, the order reversed. Can you just read that again, so. Councillor O'Malley? Um, that remuneration should reflect many other factors in addition to the number of residents represented. Many, many relevant factors, we got that yep. the first time, in addition to in population. In addition to the, and then it goes in front of the population statement. If the mover and seconder are happy with that, that can be changed. In addition to. That's good. All right. Um, then it just stops there, I think. The okay, actually, if that, was, if that was a period and then, and then <coughs> a definition of what we mean about population, I think that would separate. So the distinction between the whole board rather than numbers each represented by the whole board and yeah. rather than and each individual it. member it remains as, as a, a, a uh, qualification on that or, or a, um, explanation? Be considered when determining population effects. Yeah. Okay. All right, Councillor Hawkins. I think you did. You have your hand up, or were you You're going to invite me? Um, thank you. Just Not quite what I meant, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I think the the relevant thing for me in this whole uh, report before us is the comments and background. Paragraph four. The Remuneration Authority Act 1977 and the Local Government Act set out matters that the authority must take into account when setting remuneration, <coughs> that the authority must take account of when setting remuneration. And what we've seen in recent years um, is a very deliberate move by the Remuneration Authority away from that duty of setting remuneration and leaving it at the, at the whim of uh, political bodies to, to set their own wages and worse now, uh, the proposal to set the remuneration levels for um, for community boards that sit um, alongside them in the governance structure. And I think, as we have done previously, when we've discussed the fraud issue of our own remuneration, um, we need to send a pretty strong message um, to the remuneration authority that this is their job uh, and they should be doing their job and rather than handing it off um, to elected bodies because I think it, make, it puts everybody in a terrible situation for <coughs> our staff, for ourselves and for our community board representatives. Um, and you know we have an external body set up specifically for the purpose of making these decisions and for them to say that it's too hard and we're going to make it your problem, um, I don't think is an adequate response. And that seems to be where all of their, and I use the word consultation because they have, but for no other reason, where all of their consultation documents in recent years have been pointing towards um, going back to that, as has been pointed out, very fraught uh, previous model, and I think it should be resisted, and I applaud the intention of this that certainly sends that um, message back to the authority. Thank you. Okay. Can I suggest that if you wish to make it more explicit that you might um, frame up a subsequent motion, uh, noting, for instance, that it is our understanding that it's the remuneration, this council's understanding that it's the remuneration authority's responsibility to set remuneration for councils and not ours, and we urge them to fulfil that or something like that. That's up to you. Um, Councillor Vanders. I very much support what Councillor Hawkins has just said and, and, and your recommended uh, strengthening of uh, the uh, resolutions in, in that regard. Uh, I agree entirely with your worship that uh, anomalous situations have uh, very rapidly arisen with the uh, big pot situation 
And I'd just uh, like to add finally that I don't believe that anybody has been voted onto this council to determine their own remuneration or to determine the remuneration of anybody else. That is not what we're elected for. Uh, I think quite specifically, we need to very uh, strongly avoid any suggestion that we may have any kind of hand in that. Uh, to me, our responsibility to voters is to stay right out of rem remuneration issues. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Gary. Uh, you're going to have your right to reply. Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, in thank you, Your Worship. In general, I'm very supportive of this, and I don't think anyone would wish to return to the situation that was always offensive and divisive, where um, it provided a vehicle for grandstanding that we could do without around this or any other table. I agree that it would be good if uh, Councillor Hawkins could produce or someone could produce an appropriate amendment asking the Remuneration Authority to do its job. Um, but I would observe that I do have, uh, and others may share this, I do have a degree of um, caution around D because while we are far from what has happened overseas, um, moderating the principle of voting according to population is what leads to gerrymanders. Uh, and not so much in Dunedin, but in many parts of this country there are huge imbalances and injustices in the levels of representation in local authorities and how wards are constructed, we've had those debates here, and how our community boards are constituted in terms of large geographic areas or whatever else. Um, you can look at the United States if you want examples, uh, but their examples are so excessive and obscene they are mostly overstated, but uh, a lot of people active in those democracies are working very hard to develop a just, equitable basis to our electoral systems. And I think we need to uh, exercise a degree of caution when we start adding lots of factors or reducing the weight of population. Um, I'm not going to complicate this debate further by moving anything, but um, I, I don't like the generality of D. Uh, I think some priority, the prime factor in choosing electoral representation should be population. No problem at all with other factors being involved, but I think D is uh, dangerously simplistic. Okay, further speakers, Councillor O'Malley. The current range in the community boards is 7,300 in Strathtyre and 9,400 in the Mosgill district, um, and I don't know if the workloads and that's because of population base. And the point that the community boards are making is that effectively um, you are serving an area and you're going in for a series of meetings and you're dealing with a certain number of um, requests every time and that the workloads are not dramatically different. So all they're really basically saying is that if you do it population based, you're going to have anomalous um, remuneration. If you go in the other direction, you'll have anomalies as well, um, which is actually why basically they just want to say that it doesn't necessarily just reflect population and that in fact a community board's work and a community board member's workload is probably pretty similar across each of our boards. Okay. Um, I, um, I support these um, resolutions. I do not like and I never have liked the idea of pooled remuneration. I think it, it just provides issues um, that, as Councillor Vandervis has pointed out, we don't need or shouldn't have to deal with. Um, there's, we already have to deal with the margin for areas of responsibility, and that's manageable. But when you get any further than that, it gets really invidious. And it would be particularly invidious, as has been said, if we were to presume or been given the responsibility for determining the remuneration of community boards. Um, the, I personally think that pooling in general is um, unwise um, and the anomalies uh, lead to difficulties actually recruiting onto councils or onto uh, community boards. Uh, they tend that if, if you have anomalies and you are under remunerating, 
you're not going to get the diversity that you, that you really want and you're not going to get the youth representation that you really want because uh, only um, those who are retired or uh, otherwise well off can afford to stand and that is simply not what we want in terms of representation across our communities. So I think this is <coughs> the, the, the trend of the remuneration authorities thinking is unhelpful to the positive development of local body democracy in this country. Uh, and I, I, it's not the only factor, of course, but it is not, I personally don't think it's helpful, so I'm supportive of this. If there are no other speakers, I'll invite Councillor. We have a, um, a new resolution, E from, from? Subsequential. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I didn't think it was, uh, yeah, let's, just, let's do it separately. It'll, it, it'll look like it's all one when it gets to them, so that's fine. Um, Councillor Gary, you'll write a reply. Thank you, Your Worship, and I don't wish to complicate things further, but in the um, editing of that f D, of the f that final one, D, um, the as determined by the remuneration authority actually refers to the relevant factors. So it really should read, agrees that community board remuneration should reflect many relevant factors comma, as determined by the remuneration authority in addition to population. So that should just, it's just the order that it's in. Um, I have to disagree with my colleague, Councillor O'Malley, um, and agree in some regards, that the base work for community boards is certainly the same. That is correct. But you only have to sit in a zone meeting or at a conference and understand the uh, a huge spread of differences in community boards throughout the country to realise that there is, there, are just, there is just such a huge range of responsibilities and as I alluded to before, delegated authorities. So if we're looking in a national sense, uh, we don't necessarily represent in terms of our community boards um, that variety. However, if I deal with what I know here in terms of community boards and my own experience on the Otago Peninsula Community Board for nine years, I can tell you that the tourism layer, and it's one of the reasons that the community uh, on the peninsula um, lobbied uh, council and then appealed to the local government commission um, to have the formation of its board was because of the growing tourism back some years ago and look where we're up to now. And I can tell you that that tourism layer does add to the workload, there is no doubt. I specifically asked um, the chair of the Mosgill Tyree Community Board when she presented to our annual plan about the, um, the workload uh, and I thought her answer was a very good one. You do as much as you are able, but it's really never ending, a little bit like council work. Um, but really what I want to see us do today is send a message not only to the remuneration authority, but by how we have spoken about this, to give a clear message to our local community boards that we value them. We value the conduit that they provide both to and fro. We value the work that they do. I believe it enhances our work um, and how we talk about this is really important, both in private and in public. Uh, and so I believe the Remuneration Authority has a very good idea from the feedback they've had over a couple of years, very thorough feedback about those other factors. So I want to just comment that um, I, I heard that message very clearly from the community boards about those other factors and thank you Councillor O'Malley Malley for raising that and, and ensuring that that is reflected in the motion because I do think that is important. But the Remuneration Authority is well aware of it and they're going to have to find a mechanism to deal with that but it is important that we give that message. Uh, I thank colleagues for the support of this motion. I think it's a really important one to our ongoing relationship with community boards um, and I think the clearer message and stronger message that we can give the Remuneration Authority, the better. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Can I invite you, Councillor Hawkins? Sorry? Sorry, this isn't what I...
This is my fault. I did send that one. Um, right, I, sub now, I subsequently just, just before have. Before you start, is there a second of it? I've forwarded, I've forwarded a second one since then. Sorry. It's been a busy time. Have you been iterating? <laughs> Councillor Wilson has been giving feedback, yes. Ah. Thank you. We'll wait till we get the. Is this the one? Right. Um, I'll give, you, I'll give everyone time to, or is this a second or straight off? Right, Councillor Garrett. Okay, Councillor Hawkins, if you'd like to speak to it. You happy with the notes you've seen and references and Right, and other speakers, Councillor O'Malley. Um, rather than retain control of this function, just say perform this function. You need to perform. <laughs> no, well, that's the point you see, isn't, isn't the statement we're making that they're not performing it? Um, if this is the statement we're going to make it, because they have control of it. Yeah. That, I agree with this thing. Yep, so you're happy to change that to to perform rather than retain control? Perform. This, take out of, yep, yeah, perform. That's it? Right. Further speakers? There are none. You will write a reply. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Right. Thank you. We do too. Um, item, item 18, um, notice a motion from um, councillors Wilson and O'Malley um, that council seek an updated report on the cost and implications of a second way bridge being installed at Green Island Landfill for annual plan deliberations. Um, can I invite you, councillor Wilson, to speak to this? <coughs> In the first instance, well, either of you, actually, whoever's... I'm, I'm happy to... Um, this is after questions at um, the annual plan meeting, we discussed this at the chairs and at every chairs meeting with staff, and um, from that we thought that there were some issues that we wanted to understand better and that we'd rather that this was dealt with by way of an informed um, report from staff, um, and therefore um, this, this seemed the best mechanism to bring it forward to everyone's um, understanding for that. I want to speak, Councillor, Councillor Vandivis. My understanding is that there's no real need for a second way bridge. Um, as I gave evidence of in the annual plan meeting, if there is a situation where there is what looks like an excessively heavy load on a private vehicle, uh, they already quite easily just turn them around and put them over the existing way bridge. Way bridges are very expensive items. Uh, having more than one of them to um, uh, deal with uh, a, another line of traffic, I don't think is at all necessary. I've been to the tip many times and never found that, that it was an issue. Uh, if they want to put someone over a way bridge, uh, they already can. Well, can I point out that if that turns out to be the case, that's exactly what they'll conclude. But what this is asking for is not a second way bridge. It's asking for a report on the implications, some of which you've just mentioned. Exactly. And, and I think that a report is an unnecessary waste of, of time, actually, I think. That's not quite what I said. But anyway, Councillor O'Malley, you wish to... Right. Thank you. Further speakers? No further speakers. Do you wish to exercise... You'll, you'll write a reply? Uh, unusually, I, I will. Um, the, the issue here is that um, when you've got a delegation to staff and there were suggestions that um, it was some of unfairness to um, contractors doing that and, and some people getting a much cheaper deal than others, this just gets rid of that and it becomes much more equitable and actually starts people understanding why the costs are there because it starts a whole conversation about weight, which is how these... Um, how the charges are set. So um, I, th I think there's, and it may well come out that it's not um, worth doing, but these things are very easy to move. Um, and our understanding is that it would make um, for better management of the landfill. I'm going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? No. Thank you. Thank you. It's carried. And I will move from the chair that the meeting move into confidential for the reasons outlined in the agenda pursuant to the provisions of the local government official information and hearings act. Second, the council sustains. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. We will take a break.